discussions on uh, vibrations of beams, we have till now looked at only straight beams. However, there are various uh, places you find uh, curved beams. For example, in arches, in bridges, uh, also we have rings uh, which uh, can be treated as uh, beams which are curved. So, <coughs> today we are going to initiate some discussions on the dynamics of curved beams. So, today we are going to look at essentially the modeling aspects of a curved beam. Now, the first and the fundamental difference between a straight beam and a curved beam uh, that uh, we will see is because of this curvature, the, the axial motion or the circumferential motion is coupled to the transverse or the radial motion of the beam. So, there is a coupling between these two directions. So, we can no longer uh, treat uh, uh, using one uh, field variable for our deflection. So, we must use two field variables, uh, one uh, for tracking the, the circumferential or the axial motion and the other is for the radial motion. So, uh, as with any uh, beam theory, we are going to make some assumptions to simplify our, our uh, modeling uh, process. Uh, so, the first uh, assumption So, the first assumption uh, we make is that this uh, whole uh, the uh, the curvature of uh, the beam is So, we will look at a very uh, special situation where the curvature of the beam is a constant and the beam is a planar. So, uh, the second uh, assumption we make is the deflection is also uh, planar. Thirdly, we will assume that the deflection is small compared to the thickness, compared to the thickness of the beam, the, the deflection is small. And we also assume that the thickness itself is small compared to the curvature. Finally, we assume that the Euler Bernoulli hypothesis holds. And we along with that we say that there is no shear. So, uh, under these uh, assumptions we are going to uh, model a curved beam. So, we are going to restrict ourselves to uh, the case of a beam with constant thickness. So, let us consider so, 
So, here I have drawn a, a ring really, but it could be a part of a ring. We consider a, a small element of this ring So, uh, this is the radial direction and the field variable will be indicated by w theta comma t and this is the theta direction where we uh, So, the radius of this circle the, the dash circle which we will consider as the neutral uh, fiber uh, that has a radius r which is a constant as we have assumed. Now, let us look at this uh, little element. Now, we are going to look at the, the deformation kinematics of this little element. So, <coughs> let me draw. So, so when you uh, consider the, the deformation kinematics, you can understand that. So, this is at an angle theta and the small this is the small angle d theta. Now, initially the length of any fiber in this element at a height z so the length of uh, this fiber uh, before deformation let me indicate this by d s is we are looking at the, uh, at a fiber which is at a uh, at a height z from this neutral fiber. So, d s the length of this fiber before any deformation is r plus z <coughs> times d theta. Now, when this element deforms, now you can uh, imagine that uh, you can consider this deformation in two steps. One is its actual elongation. So, so, this moves from so any point 
which was here moves here. So, <coughs> this angle is nothing but u over r. So, u is the deflection of the uh, of this point in the circumferential direction. So, as we have mentioned that so this is u. The second uh, 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 deformation that can take this is that this deflects out radially. So, let me <coughs> draw that first. So, here is P 2 and now here is P 3. So, this point P 2 moves to this point P 3. Now, here again there is this angle which can now be written like this that this is the slope of uh, of uh, the center line of this element when there is a, a deflection in the in the radial direction or the transverse direction and which is captured by this field variable w so del w del theta 1 over r so that is nothing but that slope of the center line because w is the deflection of the of the neutral axis so that multiplied by z z is the distance of this point from this neutral fiber so this time z is the deflection so, this is nothing but the angle for small deflections we know that this is the angle times the, the radius gives the, uh, ang the, the linear deflection of point p. So, it goes from p, p 2 to p 3. So, essentially this linear distance is what is being measured by this quantity and when you divide this by r plus z that gives us this small angle. So, therefore, now when you combine these two uh, deflections then, then the total angle. So, this went this line went from here to here and now this line has traveled back. So, this angle let us say is theta prime then theta prime is given as theta plus u over r because of this motion circumferential motion and minus this angle so that is theta prime so, therefore, after deflection
d s prime if we call it d s prime then that is that is approximately this is r plus z plus w is the transverse or the radial deflection. So, that is a new uh, radius times d, d theta prime. So, we have to calculate d theta prime. So, that turns out to be d theta plus since r is a constant So, del u del theta times d theta minus so that so so this is the expression of d s prime and therefore if we calculate the strain now in that fiber at height z from the neutral uh, plane that can be calculated as d s prime minus d s over d s. And if you do this calculation, it turns out to be and which can be approximated by considering that z over r is much, much smaller than 1. So, we can take this r and this write this as 1 plus z over r and take into the numerator and you leave out uh, terms which are uh, quadratic in z over r. So, then it can be simplified So, that is the strain in the fiber. Now, using this strain we can use uh, Hooke's law to write the stress as Young's modulus times the fiber strain. So, that is going to give us the stress in the fiber. Now, <coughs> these stresses can be integrated over the uh, 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 cross sectional area of the of the beam to obtain the force resultants. So, let us calculate the various uh, force and moment resultants. So, let me first draw out this uh, free body diagram of So, this is a little element and we have the shear uh, force on this face. The bending moment and 
and the circumferential forces Now, let me calculate this uh, the stress resultants. So, n is nothing but integral over the area. stress times the area and if you <coughs> substitute these expressions and calculate this it turns out to be since there is a z term here. So, when you integrate over the area uh, since uh, this is already uh, measured from the neutral fiber. So, this term will vanish. So, you are left with this. Uh, uh, so, this is the expression of the normal force on the on the face. Then we have this uh, bending moment which is once again we calculated uh, calculate as we did for the beam. Now, because of this additional z, uh, this becomes z square and that makes it uh, an even function. So, and whereas, this becomes an odd function that cancels off. So, you are left with contributions only from this term. So, that is the bending moment. <coughs> now, using uh, and, the, and the shear uh, force as I have mentioned that we do not consider shear. So, it is infinitely rigid in shear. So, that will come out from the equations of equilibrium. So, let us now start writing the equations of equilibrium. So, first we will write the the circumferential equation. So, that reads So, rho a is uh, mass per unit length. So, r d theta is the small length of that element. So, this is mass of the little element times u is the circumferential uh, motion of the field variable. So, the acceleration and that must be equal to the forces in the circumferential direction. So, let us look at refer to this figure once again. So, in the circumferential direction we have, so n theta plus d, d theta can be written as n plus del n del, th del theta uh, into d theta and this uh, minus, so this into cosine of this uh, small angle, so that is small, so that is taken as 1 uh, minus n because of this plus because of the shear force. Uh, for example, here it is this into sine of this small angle which is d theta over 2. So, that is almost d theta over 2 and 
plus we have this again So, therefore, if you divide by d theta and uh, drop uh, terms smaller uh, than the first order, then you can easily write this equation. So, this is the equation of motion for the circumferential in the circumferential direction. Uh, next, we look at the radial direction. So, once again rho a r d theta is the mass of the little element times the acceleration in the transverse of the radial direction must be equal to the summation of all forces in the <coughs> radial direction. So, so, this is what we have. So, I can write this as so, V then there is this uh, normal force wh which is uh, towards the center and so this negative and there is a projection. So, these are the forces in the radial direction. So, that implies so this is the equation of motion in the radial direction. Next, we uh, will look at the rotational dynamics. Of this element, uh, we will neglect the rotational inertia of this element. So, in that case, it, this uh, equation actually boils down to uh, only moment balance uh, about the uh, center of mass of this element, which can be written as so m is this uh, moment. And we have uh, two contributions from these uh, shear forces about the center of mass. So, that can be combined and written as so this is r theta over 2 and this is also r theta over 2 and they are they produce moment in the same direction. So, it is v times r d theta. So, that must be equal to 0. So, that implies so that is what we obtain from moment balance. Now, we are going to combine these equations. So, essentially we are going to eliminate uh, this V and uh, also replace uh, this n. So, if you do that then uh, 
you get the equations of motion. So, these are the equations of motion for the uh, beam uh, with constant curvature r. Now, next we will also look at the, the variational formulation for this. Uh, this we will uh, need when we do approximate calculations uh, using uh, for example, Ritz method. So, uh, let us uh, look at the variational formulation. So, we start with by writing the kinetic energy. one half the mass of the little element times the velocity square. And this integrated over the full uh, beam. So, that is the kinetic energy. Similarly, we now we uh, derive the potential energy which is nothing but half. Now, <coughs> we know from theory of elasticity that the uh, energy per unit volume is stress times the strain. So, one half stress times the strain for linear theory. So, stress is Young's modulus times the strain times the strain and so this is per unit volume. So, we integrate first over the area and then over the length. Of the uh, beam. Now, we will uh, substitute the expression of uh, this epsilon and that turns out to be. So, then V So, this bracketed term is the uh, strain epsilon. So, that squared d a and this and there was one uh, 
1 over r in the strain expression. So, that becomes 1 over r square. Now, if you square this Uh, this uh, these terms. So, this will give uh, w plus uh, del u del theta whole square and that, that when integrated over the area. So, these uh, terms will have nothing to do with the area. So, it is the area itself. So, we have. So, <coughs> So, that is the contribution from the square of the, this term. Then there is a square of this term. So, you will have z square and uh, you have r uh, power 4 and here there is an r. So, that will give 1 over r cube and z square integrated over uh, the area that is going to be the uh, second moment of the area. So, the, the square of this second term is going to give us then there is this third term 2 times this into this and that is linear in z and when you integrate over the area since z is measured already from the neutral axis or neutral plane. So, that term vanishes. So, these are the terms in the potential energy expression. Now, to move on further before we uh, move further we uh, let us make a little bit of simplifications uh, using certain redefinitions. So, let me uh, redefine time. like this. So, this is a non dimensional time tau, a non dimensional circumferential uh, displacement and a non dimensional transverse or radial displacement w tilde. And I will also define Uh, the slenderness ratio which will be I will define like this. So, the uh, radius of curvature of the beam divided by the radius of gyration of the cross section. So, that uh, reflects the slenderness of the beam. Now, if you use these uh, expressions then uh, the Lagrangian can be written as so integrated over the length of the beam So, this is tau So, that is the Lagrangian of the system. Now, we uh, use the Hamilton's principle to derive the equation of motion.
which says that this must vanish the variation of this uh, Lagrangian uh, of this uh, action integral must be 0. So, if you <coughs> do that then using the expression of the Lagrangian that we have just now derived. I will drop the tilde in the in these uh, calculations now. So, this must vanish. Now, <coughs> this has to be integrated by parts with respect to time these two terms and here we have to integrate by parts with respect to theta in these three terms. So, if you uh, do that then Finally, when you uh, get the boundary terms and the and the uh, variation over the domain, So, this is so this integral. So, here you have the limits over the domain of the, the beam. So, it is 0 to some angles let us say theta bar and plus
So, this is what you will obtain. Now, from here it is uh, easy to see that this uh, using standard arguments uh, we can uh, uh, see that. So, this integrand must vanish and similarly this integrand must vanish uh, delta u and delta w being independent. So, we have the equations of motion So, these are the two equations of motion which we have derived earlier as well in a slightly different form. Now, you can uh, once again see the, the coupling between the circumferential and the radial uh, directions. Now, here since this is non dimensional these equations are non dimensionalized you can look at the contribution of these terms in the equation. Now, if uh, the slend if the if the beam is very very slender which means slenderness ratio is very high then these terms will become insignificant. In that case the equations will get simplified. So, you have uh, only three terms in each equation which you can then uh, 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 try to solve but if the beam is not uh, slow so slender in that case these terms will also uh, contribute uh, to the in the dynamics now let us look at the boundary uh, conditions so they are obtained from so so from the boundary terms we have A theta equal to 0 and theta bar so we must have this equal to 0 or u must be equal to 0. So, either the circumferential uh, motion is restricted or so which is a geometric condition and this is a uh, natural boundary condition. Similarly, at again at theta equal to 0 and theta bar So, this or so these uh, two uh, boundary conditions follow from these boundary terms. So, this is the first boundary term and this is the second boundary term corresponding to uh, displacements. So, delta u and delta w there is this third boundary term which uh, is in terms of the the slope. So, once again at theta equal to 0 and theta bar del u del theta. So, this must be equal to 0 or the angle 
must be equal to 0. So, you have uh, um, these boundary conditions. So, these are the the geometric boundary conditions, whereas these boundary conditions are the natural boundary conditions. So, now um, in case of a complete ring for a so when there is a complete ring the In that case, you do not have boundaries like this. So, what you uh, have is you have these uh, periodicity conditions. So, which means that u at theta plus 2 pi must be equal to u at theta for all time and similarly and all that follows from uh, the, these periodicity conditions. So, everything will is going to be periodic. Uh, so, dis, uh, dif, displacement, slope, uh, uh, bending moment, shear force etcetera. So, they are going to uh, satisfy the periodicity conditions. So, for a complete ring we have uh, these two conditions. So, uh, let us uh, briefly recapitulate what we have discussed today we have uh, today discussed the uh, initiated some discussions on the dynamics of uh, curved beams. We have considered in particular uh, beams of constant curvature and we have uh, derived the equation uh, equations of motion uh, using both Newtonian as well as the variational formulation. And uh, this is uh, very interesting and peculiar about this curved beams uh, that the transverse and circumferential motions now are coupled they uh, so in in the in the straight beams we have we have only the transverse motion we can uh, treat the transverse and the axial motion separately they are decoupled but uh, this curvature uh, in in the case of curved beams couples the the, the circumferential and the transverse dynamics that's what we have seen through the equations of motion so, with that uh, we conclude this lecture.